I remember the first time when I was ashamed of the Lord. I must have been five or six years old. We were at a market about a mile from the home. Uh, My parents still live in that home, uh, just about a mile away from our home. Uh, The store was called Tolly's. I just remember, I just remember, I remember the day, I remember a lot about it. I remember being at the store, I remember being right outside the store, there was a little area and they had an arcade game, I don't, I don't remember their arcade game, but some, somebody was playing an arcade game, and I was just a little kid watching somebody else play the arcade game, and there were three or four other kids around there, and at some point, maybe the game was over, one of the kids looked at another kid and said, where do you go to school? And I was immediately scared because I went to Decatur Christian School and I was afraid to say Christian. I didn't want to say Christian. I was a, you know, I, I, and I remember, I, just, I remember what was going through my head. I thought if they hear Christian, they will probably laugh. They'll probably say, do you believe that? And I didn't want to hear that. I was afraid to hear that. And so what I ended up doing was just sort of wandering off, you know, (laughs) so that the question wouldn't get asked of me. But I remember at that moment thinking, I'm ashamed of Christ. That's what I thought. And then when I got home, I remember feeling, I'm ashamed that I felt so ashamed. Now, I wish I could tell you that that's the only time that I was ever ashamed. But that's not been the only time I was ever ashamed. And my guess is that some of us know what it's like to be ashamed. Right? Have you ever been ashamed of God? Have what other people think ever kept you from inviting somebody to church? Or telling someone that the reason why you won't engage in that particular behavior is because you're trying to be faithful to God? Have you ever just made up some other reason? Has it ever stopped you from sharing the gospel with somebody because you were afraid what they were going to say? Deep down, we all like to be liked. We hate to be left out. To be thought of as different or odd or weird. And maybe you thought you would outgrow that peer pressure from junior high. Right? Isn't, that what, isn't that what it is in junior high? It's just like all kinds of peer pressure. And you're like, I can't wait till we outgrow this. And here we are adults. <laughs> no longer in middle school, just middle aged. And still we care a little bit too much about what other people think about us. Deep down, again, we all want to fit in, to be accepted, to be approved of by others. And we're tempted to be ashamed of anything that would make us less than acceptable to others. Today, I want to talk to you about being unashamed of the gospel, right? I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's our phrase. In Paul's day, in Roman society, if you wanted to be thought of as wise and respected, you wouldn't go the route of saying, by the way, I'm trusting in the one that was hung on a cross to die. In our day, it's somewhat similar Although, I think there's a certain acceptability, we're kind of still sort of Bible Beltish around here. I think what sometimes is allowable is to say that you're religious. Maybe you can say you go to church. That probably won't hurt you too much. But if you start to clearly proclaim the gospel... To tell people (laughs) that if they're not trusting in Jesus Christ, they're still in their sin and the wrath of God abides on them, well, things are going to change. The smile on their face will be gone. 
So we're focusing on not just whether or not you're ashamed of church or God generally speaking, but of the gospel itself. Are you willing to tell the gospel message without changing the gospel message so that it becomes more acceptable to people? That's what the passage is about. So in order to not be ashamed of the gospel, what you have to, what one bridge you have to cross is to not be ashamed of rejection and opposition. And one way to help you is to realize this is exactly what Jesus said he was calling you to. Right? He is calling you to himself, and he is opposed by the world. And since he's opposed by the world, he's, he's calling you to be on his team, right? Now, the whole world is divided along Jesus Christ. That is, Jesus clearly proclaimed in the gospel, right? Not, not just the one who's, you know, religiously a, a, a nice fellow, but the one who says, heaven and hell divides on me. That's Jesus, And in a sense, for you to choose Jesus is for you to say, I'm going to stand with the one that the world hates. Now, Jesus talks about the world hating him in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. He says to his disciples, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Hear, hear those words? hates me, that's what Jesus says about the world, and it will hate you. Verse 20, we remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, killing him on a cross, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So again, Jesus explains the division that he brings into the world, and when you choose him, you choose to stand with the one who is hated, which means you set yourself up to be hated. That's what Jesus is saying. You will be hated. The world then is not indifferent about Jesus. Again, if you, if you water it down and just say, I'm nice to people like Jesus was nice to people, we'll all be okay. <laughs> but again, if you begin to say, uh, Jesus is the only way. Right? If you, if you say to people that yes, you're generally moral, but, but you're, you're to worship and honor the Lord with your whole life, then they're like, okay, that's too much. So if you preach Christ as the only way, that outside of Christ all will face the eternal wrath of God, if you preach Christ as the way that you're, uh, if you preach Christ as the way to your neighbor who is pretty good, I mean, generally moral, just ignoring Jesus. <laughs> Spending his days and weeks however he feels, generally moral, never worshiping the Lord, then they'll, they'll, they will take a different stance to you. They, they've been taking a different stance to Jesus as clearly portrayed in the gospel. They've been doing that a long time. They, they've kind of forgotten that they're doing that. But when you remind them, well, they'll let you know what they think about Jesus. And they'll let you know what they think about you. The world then opposes the gospel. Paul, I mean, what did Paul experience after being saved? I mean, he, he was accepted. Remember how he was accepted by so many religious leaders? Right? He had been accepted by the religious leaders. Now, and what he was doing was he was accepted by the religious leaders by going and finding Christians and killing them. Right, people who thought they were right with God but were rejecting Jesus were the friends of Paul. But when Paul takes the side of Jesus, well, everything changed. Right? It, it's then that he receives five times uh, from the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes minus one. Three times beaten with rods, once with stones, three times shipwreck, a night and day set adrift in the sea. Dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, in toil and hardship, many sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. That's what Paul experienced after siding with Jesus. 
and so when he, when he then trusts Jesus and sides with Jesus, he is opposed by his former friends. And he had to choose, and this is important, he had to choose whose approval he was going to live for. But by the way, that's the decision we all have to make. Whose approval will you live for? Choose you this day, we might say. To be unashamed of the gospel is to choose who you must please and who you will not care if you displease. That's, that's, that's very important, too. Who do you not care? You will displease them. Can you not care about that? The Lord says we can't have the approval of both. We have to choose between two. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other. You're opposed to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. But that's, the, that's, the, that's the, a division between God and money. But, but other places make it even more specific. Galatians 1, 10, Paul talks about the gospel that he's preaching. And he says in verse 10, For am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Paul had to decide. I'm going to preach the gospel. Am I going to preach it in a way that I want man's approval or God's approval. A clear proclamation of the gospel will get God's approval, and a clear proclamation of the gospel will not get the approval of those who reject it. And Paul says, I have to figure out whose approval I want. Now, it's, I'm fine for us to honestly say, I kind of want both. Like, I get that you want both, just the Lord isn't leaving that to you to sort of just not really proclaim it, you know, make it all acceptable and then get everybody to like you. Uh, he's telling you to choose. And Paul says to end that text, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. So to choose to proclaim a watered down gospel is to choose to not be a servant of Christ. Because we're not just to like live good lives for Jesus, we're supposed to proclaim a clear gospel message that will be hated by those who reject it. More to the point about choosing, choosing comes up in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 18, 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. We have to decide, is, is this world about God and his kingdom? Then follow him. Is it really just about the world and the world's values? Well, do that. But you have to decide. That phrase, choose you this day, that's what Joshua called the people to in Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom you will serve. And then he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We have to choose. The Lord is telling you, you must choose. But what we're choosing is, yes, the Lord over the world, but you're also at the same time choosing whose approval you need and whose disapproval you don't mind. Will we stand with God and be unashamed of the world's disapproval and the wrath of the world, we might say. Or are we going to stand with the world to be unashamed of God's disapproval and the wrath of God? The next step, then, is to recognize that you, you're going to have to be, uh, to be unashamed of the gospel, you're going to have to be unashamed of appearing foolish. In God's wisdom, the rejection of the gospel by unbelievers appears to them as the rejection of something foolish. So when, when an unbeliever, when you say, here's the gospel, and they're like, I don't want that, they think, that, would, that doesn't even seem wise to me. That's, how, that's what they think of it, right? And when you say God's great and you should serve him, they're like, I don't really think he's that great. That, that's basically what they're doing. And wouldn't it be nice if it was the opposite? Wouldn't it be nice if you shared your go the gospel with your neighbor and your neighbor said, well, that seems good and wise. I think I'll just do something stupid. That's not what he's saying. 
right? You say it's wise, he thinks it's foolish, and he thinks you're a fool for believing it and living that way, right? That's the way God has set it up. When you say God is great and glorious, they don't say, well, God, he clearly is great and glorious. I see that, I mean, it's clear as day, but uh, my heart only wants worthless things, so that's why I'm doing that. that that's not what they're saying. <laughs> they're saying the things that you call worthless, the world and the, the treasures of the world, they, they think that is valuable, and in contrast, they think God is not glorious. So in God's way of doing things, even though you believe the wise thing and the valuable thing, the world thinks you believe a foolish thing and a worthless thing. Right? So it's all set up for the world to think that you're a fool to trust in Christ. Do you see? Now, this being so, then again, we're stuck appearing to be foolish to fools. They're fool they are fools for rejecting the gospel. And those fools who reject the gospel think that we are the foolish ones. Briefly, one passage we've been speaking about somewhat recently on the gospel appearing foolish is 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Right? So an unbeliever, when they hear the gospel preached, they think, that sounds foolish. Right? That's just the way unbelievers think about it, right? Again, we wish they, they saw it was wise and just didn't want to do the wise thing. But the Bible is telling us the reason they don't accept it is because they think it's foolish. You see? You proclaim it. You try to explain it the best you can. You say, I think it's great. And they're like, I think that's, I think that's folly. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. You don't, you don't think it's foolish. You, you've been powerfully changed by it. Verse 23, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. There is, here again, the folly, they, they stumble over Christ, they don't want to, the Jews won't, and the, and the Gentiles think it's foolish. But to those who is us who are called, right, this is the Bible talking about those who are saved, those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, so, so to the unbeliever, those who reject it, they think it's foolish. We think it's wise and powerful. We can kind of appreciate their side because we used to be like that. <laughs> they have a hard time appreciating our side because they've never seen it as anything other than foolish, you see? They're not going to appreciate that you landed somewhere else than they did, especially when you tell them that you think they are in danger of hellfire and the wrath of God if they remain in their rejection of Jesus Christ. They do not think that's reasonable. And the more you talk about it, the more angry they are with you. Now, and one of the things I'm at pains to emphasize here is don't meddle with the gospel. See, your temptation and mine is, if I preach the gospel straight, they'll think it's foolish. I know a way that I can talk about it and they will not think it's foolish. I think I'll do that. And I want to tell you, don't do that. I'm not telling you to try to make it look foolish. Just preach it straight. But no then unless God helps them see that it's not foolish and that it's wise, they'll keep thinking it's foolish and unwise, and they'll think you're foolish for believing it. So one way to know you're preaching the gospel way, uh, correctly is among those who reject it, they think it's foolish. It's a, it's a good test. Again, don't go out of your way to make it appear foolish. Just preach it correctly, accurately. The kind of way, if another Christian standing beside you, they're saying, this is beautiful. That's another good test. <laughs> does, does this look wise and beautiful to you, fellow Christian? Yes. Okay. So it's being proclaimed correctly. Now, do you feel like it's beautiful? No, I don't. I think it seems foolish. Okay, I feel like I've done a good job here.
The world also does not see God as glorious. We spend some time on this passage too. What is the, what's, what's Satan doing <laughs> among unbelievers? Well, 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 3 says, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So you keep, when you pre- present the gospel, you talk about God is glorious. Jesus is glorious. He's so wonderful. And they're thinking, no. <laughs> Actually, what I was doing before I heard you talk about Jesus and try to make me feel bad here, I think that's great. I think the world, the treasures of the world, all those things, I think that's great. That's what the unbeliever is saying. And you're trying to say, no, 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 can't you see that God is greater? Can't you see that Jesus is greater? And they can't see it. And the explanation about why they can't see it is that the God of this world, that is Satan, is keeping them from seeing how great God is. And we talk about this veil, right? So there's a, there's a beautiful Jesus over there. There's, there's unbelievers here. And there's like a veil where it's like a screen. And they can see, remember we talked about those missionaries behind a screen. You can tell there's people there, but you can't really make out what they look like, right? Okay, well, there's a glorious God on the other side. And there's this, they can see, okay, I see you're talking about God, but it doesn't, he doesn't look beautiful to them. And what is happening in 2 Corinthians 4, as you move from verse 3 to 4, and then all the way to verse 6, it basically says God kind of pulls back the veil. (laughs) And among us who are saved, we now can see, we can grasp how glorious he is. But those who who, who are not saved do not see how great he is. And when you keep talking about how great he is compared to the world, they're like, that doesn't make any sense to me either. And in these two ways, right, the gospel seems foolish and your claim that God is great and glorious and wonderful and the best also doesn't resonate with them, then you can understand why they think you're foolish. And and then back to the fiddling with the gospel that we don't want to do. Sometimes we talk, we, you may start out with, isn't he wonderful, isn't he beautiful, isn't he glorious? And then your neighbors don't think so. And you're like, I think I'll shift gears here. Can you imagine streets of gold and can you imagine a lake of fire? So you sort of skip, you, you, you've given up on talking about the glories of Jesus. Now you're just like, do you want to live in a place that's terribly bur- terrible burning or like mansions and gold? And they're like, oh, I can get into that. <laughs> Like, you don't need to see the glory of Jesus to like a mansion more than fire. And I want to tell you, don't alter the gospel. The gospel is not you're, you're going to a terrible place because you don't want to go to a nice place. The gospel is you were sinning against a holy and glorious God. And again, they're thinking, I don't think he's great. I don't think my offense against him is that great because I don't think he's that great. Don't alter the gospel. So how do we become unashamed? Well, we're just going to rehearse for a few minutes our previous two sermons on this verse. What we've been reading in Romans 1.16 is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel... Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So two important reasons that we talked about in two previous sermons about why you should not be ashamed of the gospel. One is because the gospel is powerful. And we focused on power. Right? So we just said you're going to talk to your neighbor and they're going to think that message is foolish. Right? But if you believe this message, the, the pure right preaching of the gospel is powerful and that God works powerfully through it, then you will think the best thing I can do is preach this powerful message and wait for God to be powerful in that person's life so that they can see things that they couldn't see without powerful God coming in and blessing the preaching of the gospel. Do you believe in the power of God? Like, if you don't believe in the power of God, you'll change the message because you'll make the message more acceptable. But if you believe in the power of God, you'll preach the straight message that you were given and you don't change it and you just give it right to them because you think God can work through this message to bring a change in their life. And you should believe that he does it because he's done it in your life. You used to think the message was foolish. You used to not see the glory of God. And by God's power... It's had its proper effect in your life. 
And so we're not ashamed to preach. One of the things that we've been saying kind of throughout the service is if you knew that there was this great and odd treatment for cancer, you'd still tell people that you did it because it cured the cancer. And you have a sin-sick soul, but you know the cure. To some people it sounds odd, but it is the cure, and there's not a second cure. So just preach the powerful cure, knowing that God powerfully works through this gospel proclaimed to wash away their sins and to give them eyes to see the glory that they didn't see before. It's a powerful message. Don't be ashamed of the only cure for all of us. So we have to see the power of it, and then we have to see the, 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 the truth of it, the message itself. We talked about last time, God, man, Christ response, right? We are sinners, right? God made everything good. We rebelled against him. He sent Christ into the world, and everybody who repents and believes will be saved. That's the message. Just proclaim that. Don't change it. Don't water it down. Don't try to remove a few things. Just preach it right out there, again, trusting in God's power, that through it people will be saved. Do you trust in the wisdom and power of God? I mean, that's my question to you. If, if you trust in the power of God, then preach the gospel. Because that's the message he powerfully works through. If you trust the wisdom of God, then that's the message, not a different message. You and your supposed wisdom might alter it, but it would make it not wise. This is the wise message. So when it comes to being unashamed of the gospel, it is a confidence exactly at these points, a powerful and wise message, a powerful and wise act of Jesus Christ washing away our sins, living the perfect life we should have lived but have not, and, and suffering the punishment that we deserve. It's, it's, the, it's that powerful working of Jesus with the powerful preaching of that very message that the Lord brings salvation. I just want to end with this, though. I, I have to put <laughs> unashamed of the gospel and proclamation together. Like the Lord doesn't want to just to hear you say, well, I'm not ashamed of it. Now, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> No, no, no. He wants you unashamed because he's, he's left you here to be an ambassador. He's, he's left you here to go make disciples of all nations. And, and, and the Lord's people have seen this. One of the things that I remember years ago when somebody pointed this out to me, it's, once you see it, it's, just, it's very powerful. Maybe you've already seen it, but I want to draw your attention to it. It's when we think of Paul, uh, I think of one of the most bold evangelists of all time, right? Like, I mean, he's, he's willing to undergo uh, way more, and I just read off a long list earlier about all the things that, that Paul suffered. And I think one of the most import, uh, astounding things about Paul is that Paul didn't say, hey, by the way, I've got this covered. Don't worry about me. I'll keep preaching. Maybe you guys could pray for the other weaklings among you. That isn't what Paul does. Paul basically, powerful, bold evangelist, says, by the way, pray for me. Pray for me that I will be bold. Let me draw your attention to it here. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 18. He's been talking about the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6. And when he comes to the end of it, he says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Verse 19, he says, and pray for me. So he's talking to these people in Ephesus, and he says, I want you to pray for me. And you're like, pray for bold Paul? Yes, pray for me. Paul, why do you want me to pray for you? That words can be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Are you saying you don't know the gospel, Paul? No, he knows the gospel. He still says, I want you to pray for me that when I open my mouth, I explain the gospel correctly. And the second thing he's saying there, and I want you to pray for me so that when I have an opportunity to open my mouth to proclaim the gospel correctly, I proclaim it boldly. 
Now again, that, to us, that may feel like unnecessary. Why would I pray for him that he'd be bold? He's always bold. Why would I pray for him that he would explain the gospel clearly? He's the one who taught us to think of the gospel clearly um, under God's help. And if Paul is praying, though, for boldness and clarity, I think that wouldn't be a wasted prayer for you to pray for yourself. That wouldn't be a useless prayer for you to pray for me. Pray that I will be bold when I get an opportunity to share the gospel, and that I will be clear when I do it. And I'll pray the same for you. And we'll all pray for each other. There, there's, there's nobody, if Paul, if Paul needs these prayers, there's nobody in this room who doesn't need a prayer for boldness. There's nobody in this room that doesn't need a prayer for clarity to explain the gospel clearly. So in verse 20 he says, for which I'm an ambassador in change, that I may, again, he re reiterates, that I may declare it boldly. So let's pray for us. What, what's the cure for your ashamedness? Uh, trusting the wisdom and power of God in the gospel. And then literally just a prayer for God's help. God make me bold. God make me clear. God give me opportunities to share the gospel this week. And when I get those opportunities, make me bold and clear. Pray for me. Pray for each other. Do it this week through. And then we'll just keep doing that week after week till Jesus comes back. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God. For a wise and powerful gospel message. Lord, you know how weak we are, how much we like to be liked. Lord, make us bold. But convince us through this word. It feels like this is what your word means for us to believe. Convince us through your word that this word is wise. And convince us through the word that this gospel is also powerful. That there's no other way for our neighbor or our nephew to get saved other than Jesus Christ. And the best thing we can do is to preach the gospel as straight and clear as we can. Lord, help us to be prayerful about this, praying that we would be clear, praying that we would have opportunity, and praying that when opportunity comes that we are bold. Lord, make us unashamed of the gospel. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.